<laughs> Hello, greetings. So we are here to talk about the scourge of modern slavery, which is a scourge, but there's also some incredibly powerful stories that you're gonna hear today and some messages of hope. So that's what I want to focus on. First of all, I'd like to tell you, I'd like, there's, there's a fact I'm gonna give you. <laughs> it's an issue affecting the entire world. Um, it's hard to give an exact estimate, of course, or exact number, but there's an estimated 40 million people in modern slavery at any one point in time around the world at the moment. Now, to put that into real numbers that we can kind of grasp onto, that's actually more than the population of Poland. So tell me, first of all, Your Royal Highness, how you and Julia got involved in this issue. Um, yeah, hi Edie. Hi everyone. Thank you for um, being here today and having us here. We're very excited. Um, Jules and I have been best friends for nearly over 13 years now and um, we first came to modern slavery when we went on a trip with my mum to Calcutta. Um, we met this amazing woman called Aloka Mitra who set up the Women's Interlink Foundation and she takes trafficked women off the streets and gives them a vocational skill of learning how to print on fabrics and make amazing bags and scarves and dresses and things like that. And that was the first time we'd ever really sort of opened our eyes to it or been heard about it, yeah. And it, at the naive old age of 21, um, mm -hmm. I can certainly speak for myself and I think usually as well, we were totally unaware of the extent to which modern slavery still exists in our day and age. We, we both thought it was something that William Wilberforce abolished 1833. In 1833, mm. thank you. Um, so we were we were really taken aback and shocked to realise how how much it was still going on and, and seemingly before our eyes. Yeah, and then from that we came back to England and uh, my mum and my, with the help of my father and us together we set up something called Key to Freedom, which is um, sort of the fashion line of mm -hmm. um, women's interlink, which sells products um, in Topshop, mm -hmm. so you can buy them there. Um, and all the products that the girls make are sold here and they, the money goes straight back to, to them. They earn a wage and therefore don't turn back, hopefully, to, to where they were before. Um, and so that was like our first ever experience of it. But then we, we all of a sudden realised that it's on our doorstep mm. in the UK and it happens all across the world. It's not just there. I mean, as you say, it's, it's everywhere. And... It's something that we then wanted to just go and like, that's it, that's our focus. Mm -hmm. You know, we're lucky to be best friends who both have the same goal to achieve trying to raise as much awareness for mm. this issue, you know? And so we spent the last five years just, is that five years, 21? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not good at math. Um, we spent the last five years just educating ourselves on this, um, speaking to as many people as possible, learning as much as we could just about what modern slavery you know, domestic servitude, workforce mm -hmm. labor, all of those terms that no one really knows about. We just wanted to learn. And actually, it's important not to get too lost in the jargon, right? Because what you guys have, have figured out is that there are stories of these real, very real people who are out there um, living pretty horrific lives. You've spoken to some of these people. I've got another fact, in fact. Uh, over 15 million people in estimated to be in forced marriage, nearly 5 million in forced sexual exploitation. And these numbers are mind-boggling, but the stories are even more moving. Tell me about some of, of these women that you've met. Um, should I take that one? Yeah. Um, one particular girl springs to mind, uh, a young girl called Farida. We met Farida last year, and she was um, from the Yazidi province in northern Iraq, and she was trafficked by ISIS. Uh, her, all the men in her family, so her brother's husband, father were all killed before her eyes and put in a mass grave. She and her sister were then trafficked and taken to what she described sounded like a sort of cattle market where these slaves were traded sometimes for a day, three days, four days um, until, their, until their trafficker got bored of them and would swap them in. Um, but Farida managed to escape only to be recaptured and then escaped again. Um, and she found an organization called Yazda who um, have, have really helped her in telling her story. Um, she's been to talk at The Hague. She came to London a few times. Um, she's written a book. She's written a book. Um, and and this, w this one story has a happy ending. You know, Farida escaped. She's now happily married and living in Germany. 
um, but she's devoted her life to telling her story to help other people in her situation. Yeah, and I think important to note that Yazda, the charity, they, they're helping so many of these victims, mm. and the, the work they do is incredible, and people should know what they do. It's, it's amazing. So that, Exactly. So yeah. that's getting to what yeah. you guys do. Before we get there, yeah. one more fact. Yeah. It's really important to have facts, <laughs> I think, this morning. It's good that you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so the UK isn't, of course, immune to this, as you guys mentioned before. And there were some figures out last week. The National Crime Agency said that more than 5,000 potential victims of modern slavery and trafficking were refu referred to UK authorities just last year. Over half of those forced labor, around a third exploited for sexual purpose. Once again, women and children affected a lot. So tell me about some of your encounters with um, modern slavery closer to home. So uh, we, I, we did some work with the Salvation Army to uh, further educate ourselves and um, they introduced me to an amazing girl who we'll call Sharon, because mm -hmm. um, it's good that she's anonymous, but she was 21 when we met her and she was in the safe house of the Salvation Army. I, I, I can't explain to you when you meet these girls, they, they're just inspiring because here we all grumble about like the rain or something. <laughs> and yeah. she was sitting there going, all I want to do is just tell people about this. I want to fight, I want to keep fighting. But Sharon was, was um, trafficked from her, by her next door neighbor in Manchester um, to a gang just down the road. And that was her experience. They, the gang um, lit her on fire. They, you know, put um, glass inside her and smashed it and mm. it, really horrible things. And, and it, that is kind of scary and horrible, but she now, the happy side of that is that she, what, she was rescued. Um, well, she rescued herself because she um, is now with the Salvation Army, but she now has a job. She's working towards getting really healthy because she's still got a few operations to go. But she just, all she says to me every day is, I just want to fight. I want to fight with you to help other people hear about this. I want to talk about it. So she was happy with me telling her story and she's, she's such a little inspiration. All she wants yeah. to do is cook us dinner in like a week because <laughs> she just wants to keep going. And that's what you need to hear and that's why it's, it's terrifying, but it's also we can do things together to help. It's incredibly inspiring to meet someone like that who's been through what she's been through and then on top of that wants to devote her life mm. to helping others not go through what she's been through. Mm. Um, it, it's an incredibly humbling experience. Mm -hmm. So what I love about your journey, um, it's a terrible phrase actually, what you guys have done is you've spent the time going out and speaking to people, you've done your research, you've talked to an enormous, just even today, just now you've mentioned three or four different organizations. So you've been researching and you're starting something called the Anti-Slavery Collective. Yes. Tell me what that is and how you're going to interact with all these other groups you've mentioned. Um, so the Anti-Slavery Collective is all about raising awareness for modern slavery um, as a global epidemic. Um, and we'll do this through various different platforms from books to events, social media, our website. Um, and we really believe that there are so many wonderful organizations out there doing great things, especially in the UK. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel and set up another charity. Um, we believe that two heads are better than one. Um, and if we can create a platform where everyone comes together, works together towards a common goal, shares data, shares resources, then that's the best way that we think we can add value. Yeah, it's convening people to a website where we can hear these credible stories, we can share data, but also it, it shouldn't be terrifying. It should be a way for all kinds of people to, to look at, to, mm. from millennials to businesses to, mm -hmm. to religious leaders. We want, we want everyone to be able to use it to, to, to come together. So this session is also about activism. And in the Global Goals cast, my podcast, we talk about what actions people, like people just here, can take. So give me a few actions that people could take if they're concerned about modern slavery. Yeah, so we, we have a, we, we, we thought of a few. Um, there's, there, I did download an app. There's an app called um, Good On You, which um, shows you basically what your supply chain looks like when, you're, mm -hmm. when you wear on, when you put on clothes. Oh. That's my mic. <laughs> when you put on clothes and see where they're from, um, it's all about asking the question. Um, the Salvation Army have a wonderful campaign, which I help them do, which is all about just 
asking the question to who you surround yourself with and mm -hmm. what you do day to day and how you can look at that, those kind of things. Yeah. Slavery today, it's not chains and shackles. Slaves, they walk amongst us. You know, you might pass one on the street every day. Um, so what we would say to everyone in this room is just to encourage you to ask the question, whether it be to someone who's working in a car wash or painting your nails in the nail salon or the cleaner or the builder, whoever it might be, just think and ask the question and, and, and be a bit more conscientious to us all. And so we've also got a lot of people from business here today. One of the Sustainable Development Goals. Who's heard of the Sustainable Development Goals, by the way? Excellent. That's what I like to see. One of them, goal number eight, is in fact to promote sustainable economic growth. You can't have sustainable economic growth if you're not paying everyone uh, for, their, for decent work. So decent work for all and ending slavery by 2030 is part of this goal. What would you like to see from business as part of this? Um, I guess the obvious answer is supply chains, you know, a lot, much more kind of accountability and awareness of supply chains. I know that's very, very hard to police or monitor all the way down to who's providing your pencil sharpener. Um, and I think the pressure is also on the consumer to hold businesses more accountable as well, um, because I think that's who they'll, re they'll really mm. listen to. It's also education. It's business yeah. leaders. Uh, promoting education within their companies, also who they can reach within their businesses as well. Um, would you like to see them as part of the anti-slavery? Yeah, we, yes. the part of being a collective means we can all work together, and it, it does mean that everyone should work together. And it's, you know, as Wilberforce said, you know, you, you cannot say you didn't know um, because this really is something that we're all, in a way, feeding. You know, just mm -hmm. just by the fact that, you know. We can't really do anything about it until everyone comes together. Yeah, there's, there's no deniability. There's no deniability. Well, in fact, in working, working together, I think, is really, is really part of it. Any final thoughts from you guys before I bring Jude up to respond to some of the things you heard? No. But so, I, when we do you, launch, we'd yeah. love to see you yeah. coming on the website. <laughs> And, and, it's all, and it's all about convening, you know, we want to get business leaders with individuals, influencers, policy makers, NGOs, all in the same room to share ideas and collaborate and work together. This is not about pointing the finger, it's about working together towards a common goal. Yeah. Great. Thank you, ladies. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Thank you for listening. So we are going, oh, I can see some clapping about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> So we want to bring up somebody, in fact, in the, in the room just before here, I was speaking to Jude Kelly, who's the founder of Women of the World Festival at the South Bank. She was saying, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you are actually part of the problem. So it's great to see some people who are part of the solution here. I want to invite her to come up to the stage. She's uh, to join us. She's the current artistic director at the South Bank Center, but she's actually leaving uh, to to step down to focus on women of the world. She spent uh, the festival, if you don't know it, does anyone not know it? No, everyone knows it. It celebrates women and girls uh, and looking at the obstacles they've faced, they have faced. It's grown to an international level. Jude actually has spent her entire career in the arts. Solent People's Theater, uh, Royal Shakespeare Company, Battersea Arts Center, West Yorkshire Playhouse, uh, she sat on the National Advisory Committee for Culture, and she actually got more government investment in arts and culture. So welcome to the stage, Jude.